All right. Great. Thank you, everyone, so much for coming tonight to hear about all that is all this wonderful work that Sam is doing and something we're contributing, we're adding as a contribution, we hope, to planning and innovation around sea level rise in San Francisco Bay. I'm Laura Tam. I work at SPUR. For those who may not be familiar with SPUR, we're a public policy think tank and we focus on good planning and good government throughout the Bay Area. And I'm Julie Beagle from the San Francisco Estuary Institute. And we're a nonprofit science research institute, and we provide applied science for state, federal, and also local agencies. And um, that was amazing how to see it all together, how much work the Conservancy has done over the years and how much adaptation is actually going on already. Um, but we're here to tell you about a new type of tool that we're developing, our two organizations, um, that we think will help us address some of the challenges particularly focused around sea level rise and other types of flooding, but spanning kind of the interests and the focuses of our two organizations, starting from the bay, working our way up through the shoreline and into the urban fabric, um, because we know we're gonna really have to look across both sides of the levee. I was gonna start with a funny joke about me swimming and Laura taking part, but it was not funny. <laughs> but there, I just did it. Um, <laughs> so um, anyway. So anyway. as we all know, Climate, everyone knows that climate change is happening and that it's already here. And sea level rise is one of the manifestations of climate change that we are going to have to live with. Looking out at, at this beautiful bay out here, it's hard not to feel its expanse and it's about to get bigger. So we'll feel even more of that. And so that what is going to happen as, sea, remember to speak into the mic, as sea levels rise, and Sam showed you uh, what the state expects, how the seas to rise over the next 150 years, um, we, what's going to happen is that the shoreline is going to change. It's going to move. It's going to be in different places than it is today. And what that looks like is different in different places because climate change effects are not just sea level rise, but they're where the creeks meet the bay. They come from upland. They look like flooding at the Embarcadero during a king tide on a sunny day. They look like flooding um, on in, in during storms and during storm surges. They look like combined flooding where a creek overflows its banks and a high tide is pushing up at the same time. And it also isn't always quite as, um, this woman over here is having fun kayaking down her street, but for many people, what, the way these effects occur is not nearly as fun. This is a flooding that occurred um, in, a, in a stream in uh, San Jose, Coyote Creek overflowed in 2017 and it affected a lot of people. So what's going to happen as we re react to the changes that are occurring on the shoreline? And this is even more not fun. This is Highway 37 for those of you who use that highway or corridor across the North Bay. It was closed for about six weeks during the winter of uh, 2017, that very wet winter that Sam was talking about where the salinity was affected in San Francisco Bay. So that was also not fun for people who needed to get to work um, or get home. So what's going to happen as the shoreline changes and as we react to sea level rise and so other climate effects like strong precipitation and river flooding is that people are going to want to do something about the bay. And so people are going to take measures to prevent flooding, which is a good thing because flooding generally isn't very fun. But the challenge is, is that we need to work together because the way that that could happen as we've heard from Sam, we have this very, very rich historic environment in the Bay that has been highly, highly mod mo uh, modified over time. And so the health of the Bay, our ability to restore those wetlands, even if Sam has all the money in the world now to do so, um, won't happen without a, an effort to think about the health of the Bay as a whole. And we do have the Baylands goals and other resources to try to figure out where those wetlands can best be restored and what type of wetland to restore in what location. But a lot of the work, um, Sam alluded to how there are many, um, many, there's a lot of regional coordination and alignment and agreement on the things that we need to do, which include restoring wetlands in the Bay. But we do also have a lot of organizations that are sort of in charge and sort of not in charge of adaptation. Who is, who is in charge of paying for managing and deciding what kind of adaptation strategy to put, put where? This is another view of that Highway 37 that I showed a flooded picture of just a second ago. And for those of you who may not know the Bay Area, 
This road, as you can see, is very low lying, crossing some very sensitive habitats in the bay, some of which are the sites of these important restoration efforts that Sam mentioned. It also crosses across four different counties as it goes from Marin over to Solano County. So efforts to, for example, manage sea level rise as it touches this highway, which of those four counties is in charge of paying for it, for planning for it, for dealing with the, the way to best manage restoration sites and mobility in the Bay Area. We do have a lot of cities and counties. We have a lot of flood control districts. We have a lot of different efforts that are going on, many of which are great, but who's in charge and how do we know who to work with to do adaptation? We also have other challenges that face our region. As we all know, we have a housing crisis. We have a lot of congestion today on the roads. Um, and as, we, as climate change continues, we may see a disaster. A lot of the motivation to do climate adaptation planning in other places around the world is motivated by having a disaster. So Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Maria, Katrina, other things. Um, you see a lot of people coming together to think about how do we plan for adaptation after this event has really uh, wreaked havoc on our communities. The theory of this project and a lot of the efforts that Sam talked about and the, the regional um, alignment is definitely around we shouldn't have to wait for that to happen in order to figure out what we want to do and what we can do. So the question is, how do we, pro how do we adapt proactively in a coherent, equitable, and ecologically resilient way? The theory of our project is that um, the bay has a lot of different types of shoreline in a lot of different places. And you don't want to do the same thing on every part of it. And acting alone, 101 local governments might choose the best, they might all choose the best things, but they might not necessarily work with each other. And so, um, and, and will we end up getting the best adaptation approach if we don't coordinate and we don't work together with the people whose our actions can affect? So we believe that we can make the shoreline and our communities more resilient by working at the right scale to implement sea level rise solutions um, and with working with nature. And so nature-based adaptation is a really important part of our approach. I'm going to hand over to Julie. So through this project, we're laying out three steps. Very easy, right? One, two, three. Um, and we're going to walk you through what that looks like. Um, and uh, what this is is a tool for all of these local jurisdictions to be able to come together in the way that Laura was talking about. So one is planning for sea level rise, uh, using nature's boundaries. So instead of planning at this individual piecemeal scale, can we plan in a way that's responding to the geographical heterogeneity of this bay? Um, and can we identify the right types of adaptation strategies for those different geographical areas? Um, and then can we bring stakeholders together across many sectors to think about what would make that area most resilient. So I'll, I'll talk to you about what we mean by this. So step one, planning by using nature's boundaries instead of our traditional jurisdictions. So our, our theory is that the, the processes that govern this shoreline, this in, uh, inland est uh, urbanized estuary are much larger than our cities and counties. And so what I'm talking about here is tectonics geology, the way the tides move back and forth and slosh around, the way the creeks flow down. Those are too large and too complex for most individual projects. South Bay Salt Ponds does an amazing job of thinking about that. But in other places, um, we really need to think about the large physical processes. So we see this need to divide up the bay into a manageable scale. Um, we know and we've seen through all of these pictures, sea level rise is not stopping at these individual boundaries. Um, and, and we think that if we don't do this, we risk kind of investing a lot of adaptation dollars um, in the wrong place. Or to be positive, we'd like to think about getting the right types of projects in the right places and using nature. Um, because that is how we're going to make our shorelines more resilient. We know that our natural solutions are more adaptable, more dynamic, and we're going to need some walls in some places too. Um, so here's these large processes that I'm talking about. So we have our big watersheds coming in, the tides moving back and forth, and where those mix. And so we think our bay is really special here. Um, but this is true in any estuary, um, that it's a mixing zone. All of these different forces mix together. And here you see sediment sloshing around um, after those 2017 storms that we've all been talking about. Um, and so this really comes back to, Susan told me not to walk over there. Um, 
that <laughs> this really comes back to tectonics and geology. How are we gonna look at that land water interface in a way that makes sense? So for people that aren't from here, the blue is um, flatlands and the red is uh, steep lands. And so we are all sitting between two large fault, fault systems in a down dropped trough. Um, I'm so happy that you said alluvial fans before me, that never happens. Um, <laughs> and so, <laughs> Um, so here we are in that trough and really where you sit, where your shoreline sits with respect to that trough determines how your land meets the water. So in Marin and Contra Costa County, we have these steep headlands that drop off into deep water with little small valleys in between. So that's a different type of setting, a different type of vulnerability, and a different type of set of strategies that can go there. Alluvial plains and fans, that's a thing, that's watersheds that come into perpendicular and normal to the fault and they windshield wiper back and forth, which is kind of what Sam was talking about that creates a different type of interface. And um, so here are those streams coming in and you can see them in the way that we've developed the landscape because they were higher. That's where sediment kind of moved around, created higher, higher places. So that was the first places that we built because it didn't flood as much. And then in between them is where a lot of the lower, uh, lower density um, kind of campuses and PDR sites were um, put because they were wetter. Now this is not true all over the place because of equity issues that we have. A lot of people live in these areas because of different laws that were enacted over time. And so just in general, this is kind of um, something that we need to consider. And then kind of perpendicular to the faults, there's wide alluvial valleys. And so these are those areas, the Santa Clara Valley, Napa, Sonoma, Petaluma coming in, perpendicular to the faults, that's where the large marshes were. That's also where all the subsided land is. That's also where Silicon Valley is. Way, way, way low. Um, major issues that we need to deal with there. And so anyway, this is all to get across that. How do we split up the bay that responds to this natural setting um, that even though we've modified it so highly, it's still there. And you can see that off the coast of San Francisco, drops deep into deep water. We have a lot of shallow bay in different places. Um, so how do we get to this right scale? So we're, we've developed this term called operational landscape units. There is a prize after this for anyone who can think of a better name for this idea. But the idea is that we're trying to develop units um, that have shared geophysical characteristics, shared kind of urban fabric um, settings that kind of might share a similar set of strategies that we can think about coherently. Um, and so they're connected to watersheds, they're connected to the deep bay, but we're trying to put some bounds around that kind of muddy area that's kind of below where we can really tell where watersheds end, um, where the waves start to feel the bottom is where the um, subtitle boundary, if anyone's interested in that, we can talk about that later. Um, but what is this unit um, and how do we plan around that? Now it's you. Um, and, and I should say, since Sam also broke the ice on the H++ term, oh, we didn't have to say that you. first. That the back of the uh, the OLU here, that the, the, how did we define the upland boundary? That is where the H++ plus a little bit of extra margin of safety is. So if we had that horrible scenario of not stopping climate change and all the ice in this, a bunch of the ice in the polar zones melted by 2150, this is the full area that would possibly have to do something about sea level rise or risk future flooding. So. We know that the, um, as we talked about earlier, thinking about the operational landscape unit allows us to bring together thinking around what do we do on the urban side and what do we do on the wetland side. And we know that the way that the land water divide looks is different looking depending on where you are in the bay. So you have places that look like these later developed sort of larger floor plate buildings over on the East Bay, which we were just looking at the alluvial fans. This is near an alluvial fan. We have some urban, like we have some suburban type development, small lots though, right there on the Bay. And we also have uh, quite a lot of jobs that are located right on the Bay as well as recreational activities. So the land water divide looks different in different places. Um, and so it causes you to ask the question, what can we do with the edge when flooding happens? What can we do with, the, with a few hundred yards in when flooding happens? When are these things gonna happen? Um, and here's another example. Sometimes we have some room to work with the edge when we have some natural landscape before we have uh, large infrastructure and people's homes. And sometimes we don't. Here we have a wastewater treatment plant, a major highway, very, very close to the edge of the bay. So we have these different landscapes, these different settings where 
urban uh, development meets the bay and future sea level rise. And so we want to think about what what are some of the aspects of land use and the way that we've modified the landscape in order to know what types of flood control strategies and restoration strategies to put where. So looking within each of the operational landscape units or OLUs, we wanted to think about housing and we want to think about jobs. Where are the places that are likely to experience disruption if flooding is allowed to occur? And thankfully, thank, thanks to the efforts of many of our um, predecessors in planning for the Bay, we have a lot of places where we're very lucky. We haven't completely urbanized the shoreline and we have a lot of room to move. So places in the South Bay, places in the East Bay near the salt ponds, a lot of places in the North Bay, you don't see a lot of density uh, very close to the shoreline. It's set back further into the OLU, which means you have more options when you have to think about planning for sea level rise. So to describe place the way that places on land are like, we're using uh, a, a, a figure of speech called place types that accounts for multiple variables and we're mapping the whole bay in this way. And these take into account urban density, housing density, job density, permeability, how much transportation infrastructure there is. And this is just an example of some of them. You can see that we have different types of landscapes and we thought through what kinds of flood control strategies can you do in places like this. And it turns out that some of them are more flexible than others. A place that's like a very high density place for jobs and housing, a downtown Oakland, a downtown San Francisco, there's not that much you can do. That might be the place where you have to put the levee. A place where you have a little more room to move, you might be able to incorporate some floodable uh, spaces into that design. You might be able to hold water in the landscape during a combined flooding event. You might be able to move some of those buildings back uh, because they are not people's homes and you might be able to use the shoreline, be able to work with a wider shoreline than you had before. So we have been defining place types across the entire region that take into account various types of density and permeability that give you a sense of what you can do. And then you combine information like this with vulnerability. So what are some of, how soon is sea level rise gonna impact the landscape we already have? We can use vulnerability and hazard information along with place types to understand risk and where in the built environment is impacted by near-term flooding, by long-term flooding, by combined flooding, by sunny day flooding, so various different types of flooding. And we've also developed sort of conceptualized transects of looking at where the place types occur in a landscape according to the different sort of geomorphological units that Julie mentioned earlier, as well as what's on the shoreline and what's offshore that could help define the suitability of different adaptation strategies in the future. Back to you. So once we have those units um, and they're characterized by all of that different information that we just talked about, our next question is how do we identify different types of measures that are best suited to that place? And again, this is coming from a lot of calls that we have been getting over the years. Is this a good place to put a beach? Should we invest in a horizontal levee here? What's the right place to put these different things? And so that's what we're trying to work out here within these units. But it really starts with what you're vulnerable to. So, you know, are you vulnerable to a, a le a, those types of berms that Sam was describing that weren't built for flood infrastructure and then they overtop? And that's a certain type of vulnerability that we have in certain places here. Or are you vulnerable to combined flooding? This is Alhambra Creek and downtown Martinez flooded. This happen flooding, this happens all the time. Laura was mentioning the different types of flooding. There's atmospheric rivers. We know they're getting more, and, get, getting more and more frequent. We have groundwater rising. We've got water coming from all directions. Um, and so this really gets to figuring out what's the problem that you have, what's the cause of that problem, and then what are some of the nature-based strategies that can help you solve that problem? And so a lot of um, very progressive counties here and BCDCs are working on vulnerable vulnerability analyses right now, but we're really thinking about matching those different vulnerabilities with the right solution. And we think, and we, you know, as Sam was saying, we all, a lot of us agree on this, that we think we can use nature to adapt. We don't need to build walls everywhere. Um, we have a few examples of beaches. Beaches are, take up less space than our big marshes, and we used to have a lot of beaches historically. Um, they knock down waves pretty efficiently. We're thinking about putting beaches on eroding marshes in some of these places, if that's your problem. This is Corte Madera Marsh, a rapidly eroding marsh. And we're working on putting a beach face on the outboard side of it. 
Um, Sam also already talked about why we care about tidal marshes so much here, which is so great. No, I was actually hoping that you would do that. Um, and we had a lot of them historically. Um, and we've did our job of filling them in and farming on them and getting rid of a lot of them. But through the bail and goals process that Sam talked about, um, and through a lot of the work of many partners around the Bay Area, including the refuge and Ann Moore Kills here, um, we have restored a lot of them. Um, but that's one tool in the toolbox. And a lot of places we don't have room for marshes to migrate. Some places we do, as Laura was saying, but a lot of places we don't. So we think of other solutions. And the horizontal levee is one idea. This is Sam referred to this in the oral loma part of his presentation with uh, working with wastewater treatment plants. So what we're doing is we're trying to put some math to this to try to figure out where else can we put horizontal levees? What are the height and slope and widths that we need? And then we can map that onto the landscape. So where else is a good place for horizontal levee? How do we do this at scale? And how do we do this in a coherent way? And so we're doing that type of thing, simple metrics for each of these nature-based solutions and then mapping them onto the landscape for oyster reefs, submerged vegetation, different types of beaches, um, the marsh restoration, polders. Um, these are those subsided areas that we that Sam talked about earlier. We have a lot of land that is below sea level. If the, mar if the dikes broke, they, they would be a big lake and that may happen. Happens in the delta. Um, horizontal levee creation, and then also a lot of the regulatory, financial, and policy tools that, that Laura was describing that we can put in place in those different place types. So what we sort of start to wind up with for each of these OLUs is almost a menu. In each of these areas, can there be a menu of all of these different nature-based solutions and also policy regulatory tools that may be more or less suitable, almost as a filtering down of the possibilities for a planning process. So this isn't a planning process in and of itself. It's a set of tools that can help a planning process. And then here's another concept that we've brought up already is that how long these things take to happen. And so there's this concept that I'm sure you've heard about called ad adaptation pathways. So how do we start with a problem and think about what we need to do now, what are things we need to start to put in place so that when some triggers or thresholds happen, it floods three times, you can't get to work. Then we switch to another path and say, okay, we need to really start to think about beaches, you know, sediment recharge. Now we need to think about buying land, buyouts, different policy tools, different zoning changes. And so we're trying to set these, this, these tools out there for planning processes to use which gets to step three, which is how do you bring people together in an equitable way with these tools to start to make those pathways? Because it really comes down to what your community values. Sort of what are the thresholds? How much can you handle? What is your appetite for risk? Um, and so putting these tools out there is part of what we're working on. So I should say, or we should say that we're kind of giving you a sneak preview of this planning tool, a set of adaptation measures and a menu that we're going to publish, it's going to be available, you can look at it and use it yourself in November. But in the meantime, we have also, this project has sparked a lot of interest by a lot of different uh, stakeholders in the Bay Area. And so some of them, for example, include Marin County and San Mateo County and MTC who are thinking of, well, not so much MTC yet, but um, B San Mateo County, Marin County are using OLUs as a framework for thinking through which stakeholders need to be brought together to deal with each section of shoreline that is relevant. So uh, this has seemed to resonate a lot with planners and to help guide project proponents towards more durable and resilient solutions. And as Julie said, um, the OLU toolkit, the adaptation measures and the maps can be useful um, as an input to a stakeholder planning process. And just to give you an example, um, there are many counties in this map and there are several OLUs. We have an example of um, some creeks that flow through uh, different places. The OLU boundary doesn't split the creek. Um, that's very important because that's a source of sediment that could supply and help to restore the shoreline. The county boundary splits the creek. So we, we don't wanna do that. We wanna figure out who these, these units can help people figure out who they need to work with in order to figure out what to do on the shoreline because their actions affect each other. One way people have done this in the past is by playing to get, playing um, games around adaptation. This was developed through that resilient by design uh, process that Sam talked about. And I actually believe they're doing a simulation of this game tonight. And Marin did an award-winning game as well called the Game of Floods. That's a hypothetical uh, setting in Marin where people can use different game pieces to try to figure out what to do 
we like to think that uh, this project can help us move, not games are wonderful, but we need to move towards planning for climate change sooner because we know that we are going to lose a lot of our wetlands by 2030, um, at the, as the Bayland Goals tells us, if we don't adapt. So let's, let's move from games to action and this tool can help. And we're actually starting that next week in San Mateo County. So Supervisor Dave Pine, as most of you know, is way out in front in terms of what we need to do and how to move forward because San Mateo is particularly vulnerable to sea level rise and combined flooding. So we're working with the San Mateo County Office of Sustainability and the Natural Capital Project at Stanford and we're bringing together all of the stakeholders, many of the stakeholders within each of these OLUs, giving them these set of tools, this menu to think about um, what are some possible strategies that can work within an OLU over time. And so this is the first time that we've done that. Um, we'll see how it goes, but I think that it's sort of the process. It's a first start to a process where we are going to talk about what are our principles, what are shared values. Um, they're probably not all going to be shared, um, especially in a place like Foster City, which is built way out on, you can see Foster City next to Bear Island, and you can see kind of the juxtaposition there. This is a particularly vulnerable, vulnerable area. Um, so we're bringing people together to try to think about what a future can look like. This is where a lot of this information is going to live. This is a web tool that we are developing at SFEI, but there's also many web tools that hopefully we can make this information available. And that's the point, is this is meant to be a living document. As we do more projects, as we figure out what works where, how effective are they? What are the trade-offs? What do you get from doing this type of thing over another type of thing? Um, we're hoping to continue to move this project forward. Um, so if you take away anything, um, from this, from our this uh, this project, it's we hope that it's that we've shown you that the bay is and is diverse and the shoreline is pretty dynamic, and we're hoping that we we're providing a tool that can help us um, talk about who needs to work together, who really needs to be in the room, and that there's no one size fits all for sea level rise. Um, hopefully, this allows us a tool that shows the me different options that can be suitable, that are feasible in different areas. Um, so that we can make our communities more resilient over time. So thanks so much.